We made adjustments. The Boston Celtics just came out and got a fantastic victory in Game 3, 104-84 to over the Miami Heat, and they were ready to go. After the Heat made those Game 2 adjustments and started hitting their threes, the Celtics bounced back going back to South Beach and took control of this series once again, now having a 2-1 to series lead. And with the Heat struggling with three-pointers, could this be the catalyst for this series if the Heat aren't hitting their shots? On Celtics Digest, we're going to be breaking down this post-game video alongside the Heat Digest contributor, Houston. And before we dive in and break down on all these stats, Houston, I want to get your thoughts and opinions on the game here. Because from the Celtics' perspective, it was a fantastic win tonight, obviously being able to take you guys down. But what are your kind of thoughts and breakdowns? Yeah, for the Celtics, like you said, a fantastic win. For the Miami Heat, on the other hand, it was a disastrous loss to say it bluntly and just in the shortest way possible. It was not a great game from start to finish. Tyler Hero and the rest of the Miami Heat offense, especially in the half court, which there was a lot of tonight, which we'll highlight in just a minute. It was it was horrible. And to say it like to say it in just a word. It was not good. It was stagnant. It was flat. It just did not work. And when you're facing a team as volatile and as explosive as the Boston Celtics, it's just not going to get it done, especially when the energy overall is not as high as your opponents in the Boston Celtics. And so when that half court offense and really the offense overall doesn't work for this Miami Heat team who does live and die by the three point shot, it is just not going to work, especially if it does not translate on the defensive end as well. Like you mentioned, the effort was a big is a big catalyst for this series. In Game 1, Boston was putting the Heat on their heels with their defensive pressure. And in Game 2, the Heat were kind of, you know, letting the Celtics settle into their offense, and it was working for in their favor. In Game 3, the Celtics went back to that Game 1 kind of style, and it definitely changed things up for the Heat. If we want to look at the team stats for the game, the Celtics shot around 48% compared to the Heat's 42%. And even though the Heat did struggle from three-point percentage, they were 1-for-11, I believe, to start out the game or some or one for nine they did have a better three-point percentage total than the boston celtics in the game the celtics again still struggling from the free throw range jason tatum missed some free throws Jalen brown missed some key free throws but the celtics are winning in that rebound category dominating on the offensive rebounds which was a huge issue for this team this year the turnovers again another issue for the heat with allowing 24 points off of those turnovers and the Celtics controlling that paint presence. So Houston, kind of a little bit of a breakdown, kind of what I saw from this game is that the Celtics weren't as reliant on the three-pointers as much, and they were kind of taking those jumpers from the mid-range. We saw multiple times Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum going in that low post, putting those guys into some fadeaway jumpers, turnaround jumpers, hitting those, and it was a very, very successful rate. So for the Heat, how do you guys kind of look to stop that or try to make that not happen for this Celtics squad? going into game four going forward if and again it's going to be difficult I, this is not going to be easy you, you're you playing against the number one team in not only the eastern conference but they have the best record overall between between both conferences in, in the entire nba this is no slouch of a team especially on the offensive end tonight they were playing phenomenal defense and we saw that in the first quarter and they really just manipulated the Miami Heat offense all night long with their defense and their pressure. I will say there are a few outliers, and Christoph Porzingis is one of them. I know I've, you've heard me say this before, and I'm starting to sound like a broken record, but in it's because of a few reasons. The first one is the fact that he's 7'2", and he can stretch the floor the way he does. But with Tatum and Brown, especially Tatum, He's going to get hit. There's, there's no way you're going to stop him. The only way you stop him is if you get him in foul trouble early, very early, because so he, so he can't get hot on the offensive end, or he just is flat out just he put on the wrong pair of socks that day and he just can't hit a basket because there's no other way you're going to stop this guy. He is a certified bucket getter, and there's doesn't matter if he's in South Beach. It doesn't matter if he's in the North Pole. He's <laughs> going to score the basketball, and it doesn't matter who's in front of him. And tonight was a lot of that. Like, what was it? The second or the third quarter, he had 14 points in like a six-minute span by himself. He was fouled on a three. Or he made two threes. He was fouled on a three. He was a fouled on a three. And he didn't make a lot of high percentage of his free throws tonight, which was really odd as he did miss more than it seems like he normally does. Every time he went up to the free throw line, it seemed like he was getting at least one miss out of either the pair or the three free throws he was getting. And it just – it was just – 
it was almost diabolical. Like every time he touched the ball, there was nothing we could do. So for this Miami Heat team, really just eliminate one player. And it's going to have to be Porzingis because that's we saw it in game two. He went one of nine and the Miami Heat had a chance to win the game. And then they ended up winning the game due to the struggles that the Celtics really went through because of the high energy defense that the Miami Heat really presented, limiting and minimizing Christoph Porzingis. But we're not going to be able to do that to Tatum unless he just has an off shooting night. So Tatum's going to get his, and we know that, and things are going to work for Tatum really night in and night out. But we have to minimize everyone else. And it's, it starts with Christoph Porzingis and just playing high energy defense overall. If we don't bring the energy like we highlighted earlier, it's just going to, it's just not going to work. And I really want to quickly highlight, can you pull up the uh, team stats really quick yep. one more time? It says here it's 10 to nine for the offensive rebounding battle. And I know you did mention it. It, it was, and it, that's obviously for the entire game. There was a stretch, especially in that first half and really that first quarter where it felt like every single time the Miami Heat could somehow earn a stop against this Boston Celtic team, which was rare, which was, it, it felt like it could never happen. But when we did get them, it was an offensive rebound. It was an offensive rebound. It was Drew Holiday. It was Derek White. It was Al, Al Horford, Christoph Porzingis. It just always, if we even worked hard enough on the defensive end and we caused a bad miss by the Celtics, it resulted in an offensive rebound. I know it's only a one, dif uh, one rebound difference on the offensive rebounding side of things between these two teams. But I promise you, if you watch this game from start to finish, it felt like it was 50 to nothing on the offensive rebounding side of things for this Miami Heat team and the Boston Celtics. I totally agree with you on that point, Houston. Like you mentioned, the Celtics yeah. on, on our kind of uh, aspect, we've, that's one of our struggles is the offensive rebound. But in this series, not just tonight, but throughout the whole entire series, that's been one of our strong suits. We've been able to take you off that you know defensive glass and we'll be able to get those offensive rebounds, be able to get those second chance points, which has helped out the Boston Celtics be able to run up this tally board and kind of bounce back. But like you mentioned, tonight, it seemed like they were dominating those offensive glasses. And looking at you know the Boston Celtics, looking at their team tonight, you mentioned Kristaps Porzingis, eliminating him because we mentioned in game one, he was the solution for beating the Miami Heat. He was dominant early on, going off again. Finished it only with a total of eight, uh, 16 points, 5 for 9 for the field, 3 for 5 from 3 with 5 rebounds and 2 assists. You mentioned Jason Tatum being that dog, 22 points, 11 rebounds. You mentioned 8 for 12 from the free throw, did struggle from that. Missed a lot more than I did think he would, but 22 points. Usually Jalen Brown struggles with the free throws. JB did miss that one free throw, but Derek White did get that put back dunk on it with that nice layup. Yep. 22 points, shot around 50%, but Derek White, man, that is my key player for the Boston Celtics tonight because he is that hot hand. He can keep going and he is streaky yeah he was two for seven from three point range but my man was 50 percent from the field in total with five rebounds three assists 16 points but when he went on those streaks those were the key streaks hit those two threes in the second quarter got that put back layup and got that finishing layup and that's when in the second quarter the heat were kind of bouncing it back it was a 10 15 point game it wasn't totally out of reach at that point then once the celtics went on that little run with jt and Derek White in the second quarter. It was a 25-point game, and going into the second half, it was basically over. You know what I mean? Yeah, it got a little bit close in the third here and there as the Celtics started to collapse a little bit. But in the fourth quarter, the game was basically over. The Celtics had total control going into it. And that's all to the fact of Derek White, you know, really stepping up, hitting his shots. What are your kind of thoughts on Derek White? Because I know a lot of people view him as underrated. You know, we view him as underrated over here as he was snubbed off the top 100. What are your kind of thoughts on him? Just it, the I will say the missed free throw by you said Jalen Brown that resulted in the putback by Derek White. I almost lost, <laughs> I, and I I'm, I I'm not even doing it justice. I almost lost every bit of control I had watching this game when that happened. And I who I can't even remember who's working, who's the broadcaster. I didn't have it up all the way. I wasn't listening to it, but I was watching it, and I was. He said it's an unexcusable play, mm -hmm. and I couldn't agree more. And I was physically losing my mind <laughs> to watch that. But again, it's just the, like we always rave about the Miami Heat, and like in previous videos when we have duoed like this after Game One, especially, it was, and especially after Game Two, is the collage of role players and the minutes and the production that we got from those role players that really propelled this Miami Heat team like DeLon Wright and Duncan Robinson coming off the bench and Haquez and Hayward Highsmith that really put the foot to the, like the pedal to the metal and a, a push this Miami Heat offense. Because again, we don't have Rozier and Butler and those are two legitimate scores for this team. And we need the help offensively to say it in the slightest, like we need the help. 
And Derek White is just like the best version of a role player you can get. And he's obviously not in the heat. He's on the Celtics. And it's felt every time down the floor, he is a legitimate hooper every time down the floor. He accepts a challenge on defense every time down the floor. It doesn't matter if he, he gets switched on, onto a big. It doesn't matter if he's playing your offensive threat he's going to accept a challenge and he's going to do a hell of a job at least that's what i've watched when i watched him play basketball and then obviously on the offensive end he can dribble the basketball he can facilitate the basketball and he can open hit open threes which fit in fits into this uh boston celtic offense perfectly as well as with hauser and pritchard obviously when everyone ha or when tatum demands so much attention like he does second he touches the basketball every all set of eyes have to watch tatum because he's going to be able to do whatever he wants. And because of that, players like Derek White, who are optimistic, have a high basketball IQ, they take advantage. And we've seen that in this series from Derek White against this Miami Heat team. Exactly. He's one of my favorite players. I was screaming on the live stream earlier that he's yeah. like so consistent on both sides of the ball. You ask him to be clutch on the offensive side to help you out, he'll do it. But if you need him, if he's having a bad offensive game, you need him to get a clamp. You need him to get a steal, a game ceiling block. He'll go out, he'll do it for you, and he'll help out on the defensive side. So that's talk about the Boston Celtics, how they actually showed up, how they balled out. Now, looking at the Miami Heat, looking at your team, fortunately not the greatest shooting night tonight from three-point range. No one really hitting consistently. Tower Hero looking back to his game one shenanigans. 3 for 9 from 3 point range total of 15 points a completely different Tyler Hero from game 2 Caleb Martin as well shot around 50% but not the 3 point specialist that we saw in game 2 alongside Nikola Jovic Adebayo also he did shoot around 50% from the field to finish with 20 points but did seem like he was struggling a little bit more with those finishes around the rim they did not seem as butter as easy as they were in the second half versus guys like Al Horford versus guys like Jason Tatum on those one-on-ones and that again just an inefficient shooting night from the Miami Heat also goes with the Celtics defense playing very very strong let's not forget to mention like you mentioned first quarter they only allowed 12 points with this Miami Heat squad yeah. which was absolutely crazy even though the Celtics only put up around 21 points I do believe just absolutely crazy to see that they were able to put up that stat line so going into game four obviously as a Celtics fan we're rooting for this bad shooting night we want these shooting nights to keep coming but what are your kind of game plans or changes that you want to see implemented for game four like you saw in game two we, no more zone we can't play zone against this <laughs> boston game we just can't do it and i am such a fan of the of the zone not only from the miami heat playing it but just nba teams playing it i loved playing it myself in high school <laughs> i loved watching it be played in high school and then in the college level it's so it's so fun to watch, especially when it's run correctly, and it can be so effective. But when you have a team like this Boston Celtic team, oh, man, it's it's just not even close. It's It doesn't even seem possible to play. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that you have two players in Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum who can just simply put their head down and score the basketball. Obviously, people are going to have off-shooting nights. It's going to happen. It doesn't mean they're bad players. It's just the way the ball goes, okay? It's the way the ball bounces. But again – outlier is going to be Porzingis you guys did very little of where you feed him at the free throw line it really the free throw line extended if you will and then he turns and faces up and then it's an isolated play where he can either if he gets collapsed on he can then pitch it to the outside or he can just run that one-on-one -on -one matchup on whoever is then guarding him at that free throw line because he can just rise up and shoot it you guys did not do a lot of that which I think was a huge benefit to you guys I have to mention this because I you did uh, highlight Porzingis he had more points in this game in the first three minutes of the opening quarter than he did the entire game two. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys were only up nine. And this, it just, we can talk about this forever, but we, we only put up 12 points. You guys had 21 points at the end of that first quarter. Porzingis, again, had the performance he did, outscored himself in that from the previous game in that opening quarter. And we were only down nine. The mixed feelings I was going through in this game are just absolute. I am in shambles to say the <laughs> least. But going forward, we have to eliminate Porzingis, at least minimize him. Again, Tatum is going to do what Tatum does. We have to play good, high energy man defense. If you guys don't want to score, if you want to start 0 of 5 again, Tyler Hero, if you want to shoot 7 of 29 from the field, that is fine with me. But you better slap the ground defensively, accept the challenge, and play hard-nosed defense. I don't care if you get two technicals and get kicked <laughs> out of the game for over-exaggerating and jumping at the ball and cry, trying to make good defensive efforts. I don't. If that's the case, thank you. But you <laughs> have to accept the challenge. It's not just Hero. It's everyone because we're not going to have a chance. We have to win game four. 
We talked about this off camera. They have to win game four because if we go back to Boston down 3-1, yes, I would love to see them come back and win it. But let's be serious. Let's be – let's use some – like, come on. Let's not <laughs> just lie to ourselves to feel better about ourselves, okay? This team is a, a team of Avengers, and there's no way we're going to be able to go back in the Boston with – how volatile they are with how inconsistent we are on the offensive end. We have to do that. Play high energy defense is just the main key. I know I'm rambling, but nah, high energy good. defense, man coverage, drop the zone despite loving it. Yes, you can full court press in that zone, but after they break half court, man defense, high energy, trap if you can, <laughs> depending on where they are and what the scenario is, obviously, but you have to let it fuel it. We had two, or you guys had two fast break points. We had six fast break points tonight. It's not going to happen. Like I'm trying not to laugh. It's just not going to happen. There's no way that this half court, or this team, this Miami team is going to have to rely on their half court offense. And again, I'm not even going to highlight the fact that we don't have Butler and Rozier because everyone knows that. But it's it's been all season. We cannot rely on this half court offense and then not run in transition and get some easy baskets. It's just not going to translate to wins for this Miami team. Exactly. So you're rooting for the switch on the zone. Obviously, you're rooting yes. for the game four win because like you mentioned, like we talked about off camera, if the Heat do lose this game in game four, I think the series is a complete wash. At the, at the beginning of this series, I was predicting six, but all in all, the Celtics are able to come up on top on Monday night. I do believe that it will be over in five. But as we know, the Celtics made their adjustments for game three. You guys made your adjustments for game two. So we'll have to see. The Heat could bounce back. They can make their adjustments for game four. And we're hoping for an exciting game. You know, an exciting series. We want to be able to break these games down. They've all, the Celtics wins have been blowouts by 20 points. The Heat game was matter of factly known for most of the game that they were going to win because they were hitting those three. So we want a good, tight, close battle going down to the wire. A nice, nice fi fire finish for game four or game five. That's what I'm hoping for at least. But again, as we broke down this game for post-game breakdown, we appreciate you guys for tuning out and coming out here. As the Celtics got this win, they made those changes. They stepped up and they got their job done versus the Heat, winning game three in South Beach by a total of 20-point victory. Absolutely fantastic for game four like we mentioned we'll have another post game video breaking this down alongside my buddy houston so make sure to stay tuned make sure to hit that subscribe button check houston over out on heat digest for all your heat news as well and we'll catch you guys in the next video have a great rest of your night now y'all peace out